Hello and welcome to the Tech Raptor podcast. My name is Andrew, Senior Content Manager here at Tech Raptor. Today I am joined by... Rutledge well, Doggett, Site Founder. And Aaron Van Dyne, Staff Writer. And we are here, we're all very excited to be here today to talk about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. We have all played it, we have all finished it. I think it's safe to say that we have all loved it. Um, we're going to be doing some some just general chatting about the game, probably just the first few chapters and, and some non-story related stuff at the top of the show before diving into some more spoilerific stuff. Um, you know, once we do get to spoilers, we'll let you know. We'll put the word spoiler up on the screen um, so you don't have to be worried about that. Or take a peek if you're interested to know what's uh, what's going on. So before we get fully into the rebirth discussion. I wanted to know from you guys what is your history with Final Fantasy VII? Um, Aaron, if you want to, if you want to kick us off. Oh my goodness! So I've played the original Final Fantasy VII way, way back in the day, but it actually wasn't the first Final Fantasy I ever played. Um, I did not have a PlayStation, the original one, uh, when you know it was. Well, the thing to have. So uh, when the PlayStation 2 came out and I played Final Fantasy X, I was like, you know, all right, I really like I really loved Final Fantasy X. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go back and play these other ones. And that was actually when I found out about Final Fantasy VII. And from there, I played eight and nine. And I really got into the series around that time. And you're just overall very into the Final Fantasy franchise as a whole aren't you <laughs> yeah i mean you could say that i have a, a whole a website that i've had since gosh 2009 at this point so yeah. and then uh you know i've played every final fantasy since and I, i'm still playing final fantasy 14 on top of that so yeah <laughs> that, that's probably an understatement that's that's dedication is what that is <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's definitely one of my favorite series, so for sure. Awesome. And Rhett? Um, I won't say Final Fantasy VII was my first game, but it was one of my first after Commander King. And this is going to be a throwback Dinosaur Safari in 1994. So, uh, yeah, Google that one. It's interesting. Uh, but it when I got my PlayStation um, 1, I want to say like Christmas of 1996, Six was when it came out in the U.S., right? Or was it '97? I can't remember. Um, whatever Christmas that mid '90s, yeah, whatever Christmas that came out, um, or was right before it came out, they had a demo disc for Final Fantasy VII with the PlayStation One. Shout out demo discs, bring them back. And uh, I must have beat that demo sixty times until uh, one of my dad's friends from work was like, "Do you want the whole game?" And uh, yeah, and then that was what ninety seven. It's twenty twenty four, and I've probably beaten it twenty times over the years, or picked up, made it part way through, and then just decided to restart again, as one does. <laughs> um, so I beat the I I wrote the preview for a remake. I beat that demo also at least twenty times. So it is a, a series that is near and dear to my heart. Um, one of my first games. So. Huge fan. I assume that we were all fans of remake. Um, did did you guys think that the the changes that the ending was good, was bad, was divisive? How are you feeling about that? And then, kind of, what were you looking forward to getting into with with rebirth? Um, I actually so going into remake, I kind of I think I already knew at the time that they were going to be making changes uh, because. Square Enix loves to spoil everything in their marketing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, of course, you know, they show stuff and nobody had any idea what it was at the time. So I was like, all right, you know, I, I'm excited for this game either way. So we'll see what happens. And by the time I did get to that ending, I was like, you know what? I think it's fine. Um, they clearly want to say, you know, we have a different definition of what a remake is. It's not you know, a one-one <laughs> remake. We're not just remaking the same experience that you played back in 1997. We want to do something new, and I actually think that's a great idea. So I really enjoyed it, um, and that kind of uh, transitioned over to my expectations for Rebirth, where 
you know, what are they going to change? What's going to largely remain the same? Uh, and then, you know, we're going to wait and see now that we're getting out into the open world, uh, how that's going to be different. Yeah, that was a monumental difference. <laughs> I recently <laughs> replayed the start of, uh, of Final Fantasy VII on Switch um, over Thanksgiving break. Um, and boy, boy, is the open world a different experience now. <laughs> Um, that was insane to see how many differences the world Intel fleshing that out the little uh, you know the little settlements and ruins that you can find everywhere uh, no stone left unturned I think was was all of our experience in rebirth yeah, yeah. and I think it's surprising that they went that route because they could have just you know kind of cheaped out in a way and made it really linear <laughs> like or even just like uh you know like final fantasy 12 has the like the interconnected zones that's sort of what mm -hmm. i expected at first but they kind of have this well it's not like a traditional open world but they're calling it one so it is a lot bigger and i like i had no expectation that they were going to go that path at all and they pulled it off it wasn't overwhelming i think is the big thing like the different objectives were peppered around enough that it didn't feel super dense. And when you are doing like side quests and things like that, it's not like typical just kill or fetch quests. And for some of them, like, uh, I'm trying to think of what's a spoiler and what's not. There, there were a couple quests that you do that kind of add even more context to the larger story. Um, that I thought was a really good way to go about like, oh, you want more lore, do this. Um, and so if you want to just engage with the main story, you can. But if you try and do everything, you're going to get all of these extra little tidbits of lore and story building around each area. Yeah, I think an early example of that is all of the stuff with Chocobo Billy and his, yep. you know, for, for such a bright, cheerful character, his really tragic backstory <laughs> about his parents uh parents you know descent into gambling and death uh yeah it was, was shock early on yeah it was a little dark um <laughs> but yeah i mean i think the the open world was is really well designed they took elements um of the original and made them part of like objectives or something along those lines instead of full-blown areas Again, I think it's still early on, but like you don't truly go to Fort Condor um, to do the mini games, but you still do the mini games. So they mm -hmm. found ways to say like, okay, maybe we don't do this part, but we can still keep something that everybody loved. And that was Fort Condor. They did introduce in episode Integrate, right? The Yuffie DLC of mm -hmm. Re. I never, I never played it, um, but I assume that a lot of the mechanics were the same across it yeah they were they were so i'm not really surprised that they i guess reused it for rebirth because maybe a lot of people didn't actually play it like you <laughs> <laughs> and they made sure to put it in your face and you know bait you with a bait you with a lore item <laughs> you gotta do it you gotta engage in the mini games yeah, yep. I think it like like we already said that it, it makes sense to do it that way though because it's one of those things that it might not have transitioned well to like realistic 3d yeah a hundred percent i mean even i don't remember who said it but a lot of their like mindset behind what they were doing with rebirth and even remake was just to contextualize things where they could as well because i mean back in the day og final fantasy 7 there's only so much like world building around you you can do um, and I think they've done a really good job of saying like, the, you know, we'll keep these elements, we'll expand on these elements, or maybe we'll dumb down some of these other elements. And it really made for a cohesive experience. Um, you know, just adding small little things that give you a little bit more to do, let you see more of kind of the, the inner, the interactions between the different characters and cloud and all that kind of stuff too. It's really good to see the world be a main character in this one. In in remake, it was all about building up who is Avalanche, and in this one, I feel like we we got some really good character development moments. 
but just the the amount of time spent fleshing out the world, um, I was really, really uh, happy to see um, it all. You know, it's not just a bunch of loosely interconnected towns for me now. It like it feels like a cohesive world. <laughs> Dude, yeah. stepping into calm for the first time, mind blowing. Just yeah, to bring um, back. <laughs> So they actually had Calm in the at the preview event that I played as well. And like when I first saw it, I got like super emotional. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like they really, they did it. I can't believe it. And, you know, I kind of had that same feeling like at all the different locations like Judon and later at the Gold Saucer and Cosmo Canyon. It's like, wow, like I never expected it to be like, you know, this detailed. It was such a such a slap in the face to go from how kind of uh, I mean how derelict North Corel is, and then you you get the gondola, and then it's Disneyland on steroids. <laughs> yep. That was a shock. Yeah, Musical yeah, you, they really couldn't display that quite as well in the original, but in in Rebirth, it is not unnoticeable for sure. <laughs> so we talked about your you know your guys appreciation of the story um and everything um talking kind of early the balance between story and mini games did you ever feel uh that the mini games were a bit uh jolting a bit of a tonal shift from what you're up to um i don't think it was a tonal shift more so than maybe they kind of piled on too many of them <laughs> because you had, you know, you had like the obvious mini games like Queen's Blood and uh, some of the stuff you could do at the Costa del Sol, but then some of the side quests have some and they're really kind of tedious at times, I felt like. And some of those I was like, well, I really don't want to do this. <laughs> 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 so it was more something like that rather than like a tonal shift because i feel like uh, on the whole they really embrace the kind of like late 90s sort of feel that the original game has and i really mm -hmm. actually love that about the game yeah i mean go speaking about you know golden saucer like the fact that they were like you know what? we'll bring back all the games um was was nice. Like I didn't. It wasn't like I didn't expect it, but it was still like kind of cool to see those games that you would have played a bunch of times in in OG Seven and see them like larger and expanded. Um, that that type of kind of uh, expansion I thought was really good. Were there any particular mini games that you guys would reach and you just go, "Fuck, not this again." <laughs> the the mog house one. Oh yes. my god. <laughs> Fuck those little shits. Uh, <laughs> my oh wife, my god. My wife is like, you failed again. I was like, shut the fuck up. I'm gonna finish this. <laughs> like, I was getting so frustrated with that last one. Yeah, yeah I feel like it's just really not very intuitive and the the stuff that they kind of throw at you is really not fun. It's unfair. Because you put them in their dumb little pin, and then they still keep throwing shit at you. So what's the <laughs> yeah. point? That, and they can get hurt by their own attack. So it's like, well, yep. There was a, that was a bit. That was the one thing that I feel like was the largest deviation from the original Final Fantasy VII. That the Mog mini game in Seven was all about teaching a Mog to fly so that it could get laid <laughs> for <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Ah, uh, evolution. <laughs> now, for me, I think, I think my least favorite mini game was maybe the frogs, like the Fall Guys frog mini game. Oh yeah, and they had that one oh, with yeah. the with the soccer ball and red. Yeah, the the totally legally distinct Rocket League. Yeah, that one was frustrating just because you know, the controls weren't that good. I thought. He was yeah. very floaty. Yeah. Um, that, uh, yeah. I, I love that. I played the red one. I'm like, yep, Rocket League. And then it was like, yep, Fall Guys. Like, well played. Yeah. I was, as someone whose favorite Final Fantasy game is Final Fantasy XII, I was so excited that one of the mini, mini games had the Gambit system. <laughs> that 
I never in a hundred years would have guessed that the Gambit system would be anywhere in this game. <laughs> yeah, I feel like they they almost kind of like took different elements from other parts of like the Final Fantasy series and put that into this game, which was interesting. And they totally stole Chocobo Racing from Chocobo GP. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even the card game was taken from other other games. <laughs> it was kind of yeah, loosely yeah. based on Triple Triad, right? Or at least that's what I've seen people comparing it to. A little bit of eight, a little bit of nine. Yeah, mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. And then, like, it kind of, I think somebody said it's basically Marvel Snap, which I can see for sure. Big Snap energy. Yeah. The idea of the three lanes and, and you only get points when you win the lane. That Queen's Blood absolutely took me by storm. I thought loading it up for the first time, I'm like, okay, this will be fun. I'll play a few rounds of this, you know, or I guess I'm playing this game to also write guides. I'll force myself to play all of this. And now I've spent five hours or something today trying to beat just the hardest challenge in the game. Um, it's like yeah. Grant all over again. Honestly, I was surprised how prevalent it, it's actually in the game and how they kind of integrated it in each area. And it's not just like, you know, just some side thing you can go do whatever. But some of the characters actually have stories. And that really surprised me. I I definitely laughed when they first had the dog that was the <laughs> the player to, to then follow it up with the chocobo. It's like, oh, you know, the, Apparently, there's some dog who also plays. It's like that is a weird callback. <laughs> yep, yep. And he's like, I mean, he's gearing up for a tournament. I'm like, okay. You know, that's just no, the way Queen's it goes. Blood was phenomenal. Like it's very well designed from a, a gameplay perspective, and I would be interested, kind of, to see it turned into a mobile game. Honestly, I could see them do it uh, for sure, just because of how, like I said, how fleshed out it is. And it's probably the most well-rounded minigame that they have in the game. Oh, yeah. I mean, Stretch and I were talking about it a little bit before the podcast. Like, it, the final thing that you're going through is really just a uh, conglomeration of all of the skills you picked up doing literally everything else. From you know card destroying to conserving your cards and like all that stuff, they thought about more mechanics than just number make go flip um, mm -hmm. of of eight. Yeah, I mean, right. You even pointed out when we were talking that a lot of the game is you know win by going right. Like as long as you have stuff to like push and take over and and you know defensively block them out, you can normally do that. But then it gets to like the chess puzzle kind of like get mate in three kind of kind of card carnival games mm -hmm. and also the tournament and then this this survival gauntlet thing that um i've been doing it's like eh, we're, we're gonna push you <laughs> you've got to specifically make a deck for this scenario otherwise you know a regular deck will never win in this mm -hmm. in this situation um which is wild So uh, they they definitely thought through a lot of what they wanted to add and made it very meaningful. I think is kind of where I walked away at the end. Um, was like nothing felt super cheap or super um, not so fleshed out. Even if I hated the Moogle stuff, like I actively saw everything out. Like I was telling you guys yesterday. I was like, all right, I'm just going to mainline the story so I can be ready for the podcast. But then I just kept doing side shit, um, which part of it is like a pathological need for me. But also part of it is like, it's pretty freaking fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and they, they really designed the game to like cater to that, though, I feel like they're like, OK, we're going to like put all this stuff in front of you and we want you to do it. Whereas, uh, you know, some other open world games will be like, OK, you just go do whatever you want. And you kind of have to seek out quests and things like that. So I kind of appreciate Rebirth's approach in that aspect. Well, it actively rewarded you, too. Like if you did all of the um, like all of the defeat monsters in each area, you fought, you know, what was always like a unique big, big bad of some kind. Um, and so they're like, oh, you step through this. Let's show you something that you probably remember or um you know some of the side quests sent you through areas that you didn't 
uh, explore too detailed in the main story and things like that. So they just kept saying like, all right, if you want to do this, where it's more than just like a number that you're checking off. They they really approached a lot of the world intel in the same way that a lot of the end game and the ultimate equipment in Final Fantasy X was done. That kind of like slow layering that mm -hmm. you might start with all of these things and just do a couple, but then you get to like one point and you're like, okay, well, now I've got this thing and to complete this thing, I need to craft this item to craft this item. I need this Malboro tendril, this Malboro tendril. I don't know where to get it. Oh, I completed some more ley lines and now I can fight the Malboro, which will then let me craft the item, which will let me complete a side quest. And then that side quest will, you know, give, give some kind of a big benefit. Um, yep. That, that layering is really intelligent and really engaging and also well, and you had to do the crystal scan to get the transmute to even craft that item too yeah so they, they layered it all together and then even to make the game easier that like as you get all of the crystals then you get the transmute chip which lets you craft the planet blessing of that area um which i am forever you know under <laughs> under what i need <laughs> yep I'm still looking for more transmute things. I'm like 90 plus hours into this game and I've got equipment that I need to be crafting level 16. And at the moment, I, I'm, I'm not able to reach 16. I'm just stuck perpetually at 15. So I know that there's some, there's some items out there somewhere that will unlock more things for me to craft so there's that a, uh... I can get this. I'll say the battle square in Golden Saucer has something. Okay. Battle square in Golden Saucer. Yeah, it's one of the it's one of the higher level uh, fights you have to do that you get it as a reward. Oh yeah, yeah you know I think I saw that actually. Okay, well I guess I know what Which I'm. Which will tie into one fight. of the guides that you're going to be writing. So. Oh okay, fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's even more more cryptic. I love it. Yeah, I literally, yeah, I'm trying not to spoil anything, but like I, I spent probably two hours just running around Golden Saucer, just talking to everyone I could and seeing everything that I could um, mm -hmm. when I got to uh, the second half of the game. Okay, interesting. Well, I, I mean, I've been doing the Queen's Blood. I've been doing... Yeah, most of Queen's Blood. It's so good. It's it's so good, man. Like but I've had a couple where I was like, you know what? I want to go back and fight that person now. Um, yeah, no, they're just old fun battles. I just did a Red Thirteen refight. Um, that he was meant to be rank ten. He was not rank ten. <laughs> <laughs> that that poor guy. Uh. So are there any other things that you guys want to talk about that are non-spoilers? Um, any general comments about the story, the gameplay, the music, anything before we hop in and it's free reign? I will say the um, the party and folio system is interesting. Interesting uh, in a good way or a bad way? I'm not sure. Uh, like the, the party system is clearly tied to your folio level, so it incentivizes, um, honestly, completing world objectives like we've been talking about because you get party XP for each one. Which I know we were talking about the what's the point of doing all three monster things? So if you do one or two, you get five party XP, but if you do all three, you get 10. Mm. Um, I did figure that out the other day. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting the way that it it kind of gives me Final Fantasy X vibes a bit. Um, it so looks like the Sphere Grid. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and then kind of how you unlock synergies and and kind of uh, essentially give your characters give each one passives. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was an interesting way to kind of let you spec each character the way you want albeit like they're not huge bonuses like 
what is it like three percent extra damage with fire or whatever um but it was kind of an interesting way to make progression less than just level go up add more materia um i thought it was it kind of forces you to think through your party composition and and things like that when you're making changes there's definitely a different skill curve to understanding how how everything will function together and who you should equip with what that definitely when you first get into the game like i was looking at it and it's like okay i'm just gonna spend where i can spend and mm -hmm. didn't really worry about it but um i definitely took some time to you know wipe out all spec points and go through and redo a lot to to specifically tool at the end yep same yeah, and I think it's actually interesting that they focused on that um, rather than uh, like the battle system itself hasn't really changed that much. So, and it does make sense to me that they didn't do that because uh, they, uh, in the interview I did, they talked about how the feedback that they received for remake was really positive. So they were like, okay, we're not going to change the battle system that much. So instead, they they focused on these like. Uh, you know, kind of back end systems like the those little guides, and they said, okay, you know, you can take care of your character that way rather than you know we're just gonna put in all these different abilities that change the game up. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like I think they realized that people like what they did, and they were like, okay, how do we like make it a little better without blowing it up? Yeah, because, you know, if they change the system, the like the battle system too much, you know, people might not like it. <laughs> Especially yeah. if, you, if they're trying to get people in, you know, this is our second 60, 70 plus hour game. And we've got another one probably coming in three to four years. Uh, yeah, and, and it's not like, you know, a sequel where it takes place years later. It's like, okay, this takes place immediately after, <laughs> immediately after. the first yeah. one. So it, it makes sense to me, and I, I really respected that answer that they gave me. It means that they, like, they, pay, they do pay attention to what people are saying, and I think that's super important. Oh, yeah, important for sure. Uh, they they like... did talk about that as well. They're like, well, you know, we didn't really receive a lot of negative feedback about a remake system, so... I think it, it really shows in, in Rebirth. The battle team can give themselves a pat on the back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did like, they did add like the, the synergy abilities, which I thought were really cool. Yeah. Um, and they kind of added like that, like that little extra push when like, if you've already used your summon and, you know, you, you really need some extra damage. Yeah, no, those, those are a lot of fun. Um, especially just like, letting two people go off and do a tag team battle while you swap into the third character to like just start working on that ATP gauge. Mm -hmm. Well, and some of the, the newer abilities were interesting too. Some are like some are reds and uh, Yuffie's specifically have like, um, you basically charge them up and they become more powerful. So it's like, okay, if you focus on playing this character, like you can kind of get a little more powerful if you just focus on them throughout the single battle. Um, and I thought that was cool. Yeah, and Yuffie, I actually thought she was really fun to play in the Intergrade. So I'm really glad that they kind of, they brought her back as a full party member in Rebirth. And she gets to do everything that she did in Intergrade, just, you know, with those synergy abilities and working with the other party members. Yeah, the one disappointment I will always have is that she uh, didn't run by me in a in a field and steal my materia. <laughs> well, uh, they're probably going to save something like that for part three, maybe. I hope we'll so, <laughs> because that shit was like infuriating as a kid. It was like um, even even in the original, like when you get to Wu Tai and she takes all your stuff, and I was just like, you know what? Uh, no. <laughs> yep. I guess you got a lot of that energy in the the Crisis Core remake too. I kind of forgot about that as I was playing through, and I know that that's Andrew Otten's favorite game in the world. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um how how far after the the city of the ancients and the the temple is it that the party gets to wutai because that i mean it's always an interesting thing when a, like when a new game in a series happens and you've got to figure out yeah. how to depower all of the characters that you know if they manage to make that closer to the intro like you'd be powerful for a chapter and then take all of your equipment and gear and like 
lose it, it might be a good way to reset the party. <laughs> yeah, I can almost see them opening with that, actually, because, uh, well, it's kind of a spoiler, but if you know, you know based on what happens in Rebirth. Um, but they did specifically exclude Wu Tai from Rebirth, as they said. Uh, so I could see them like opening with that and then kind of going from there, like, okay, well, you're over here, but then, you know, things happen and, you know, you're picking back up the story. Yeah, there's definitely going to have to be some some deviation. Um, probably from a little bit of the story. And I'm guessing Wu Tai is going to be super fleshed out. Um, and it'll be a pretty big area. I'm sure it, it'll be powered with the PlayStation 6. It's going to be huge. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up being like a PlayStation 6 launch title at this point. Yeah, that would be God. It was hard enough to get a PlayStation 5 at launch if they had the new Final Fantasy as a PS6 exclusive launch title. It would be mm -hmm. impossible. Oh, man. Well, I You're really to play hope 14 it grand take. on eBay. Yeah. I hope it doesn't take another four years, but, you know, they already have most of the world made, so hopefully it won't. That's that true. That's true. So I think we've been we've been dancing around it for a while. So I'll go ahead and throw up this spoiler sign. So going forward, um, we are going to be chatting about the differences that happen in the game, major story moments, late game interactions with characters, um, super bosses, surprise appearances. Um, so if you if you want to keep sticking around and listening to that, you know, more than welcome. Or if not. You know, play the game, come back, listen, um, and let us know your thoughts. But uh, that spoiler sign is up now. How did we feel about the nomorification of <laughs> Final <laughs> Fantasy VII? Oh, boy. Well, I knew it was coming. <laughs> like, like, you can't you can't say that, it, you know, it, it wasn't going to happen because, yeah. it, you know, it did happen in Remake. It was probably going to happen in Rebirth. And I did sort of, like, they did show some of it in marketing once again. So, you know, typical Square Enix, that, we're going to spoil everything, especially in, in the lost, last lost trailer. Yes, plus showcase. They were showing Chapter 14 cutscenes. What the hell, guys? Yeah, and I was watching and I was like, wait, wait, this looks like Endgame. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I really have no qualms with the story of Rebirth. I think everything, like we talked about it earlier, every time I stepped into a new area, you're kind of, I was kind of sent back to childhood, thinking back through like the first time I walked into Junon or um, stuff like that. And really seeing these, these places that you've been to at this point more times than you can count over the years as you replay the game over and over again and just get to see the fleshed out world and like made me fairly emotional in a, in some places. And then every once in a while there'd be the kind of like weeb stuff and my wife would be making fun of me. Um, but like it, it with the exception of the temple of the ancients, which made me want to pull my hair out. Um, I think that the way they went about telling the story and, and kind of making the tweaks that they did. I thought it was really solid. And the very end, when you're by the tiny Bronco, I thought was a really impactful way to end uh, part two. Like, I thought that that was in incredibly emotional um, way to close it out. Yeah, and I will say, like, as far as the Nomura stuff goes, uh, they did put a decent emphasis on inserting, uh, like, Crisis Core elements. And at first, yes. like, I thought it was going to be kind of tacky, and, and and I wasn't going to like it, but I found that it really fit for the most part. Um, I really didn't think it was awful, and that really surprised me. Even the stuff with Zach, at first, I kind of groaned, like, oh, like I'm <laughs> so tired of seeing Zach and everything Final Fantasy VII. But I think his role ended up being fine, and even, like, you know, the segments with him, I was like, okay, well, you know what, I, I'll, I'll deal with it. <laughs> I like Zach. Um, and I, I know that, like, I'm going to keep bringing this up. Andrew hates him. 
Andrew Otten just absolutely does not like Zach, but like he's just this goofy, goofy guy. And I I really, really like uh kind of each of his little things that he was doing where it was like semi-serious, but you still had that Zach flair to it. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't hate him. I just think that yeah. like it, it's pretty obvious that they keep inserting him because he's popular and that kind of mm-hmm. bugs me because it feels like he's just getting like forced into the narrative because of that reason. I'm curious if they're going to expand on it a lot in the last one, because we still haven't gotten to kind of the iconic cloud falls into the live stream type stuff. And I'm curious what that's going to look like. Yeah. I mean, they, they did kind of, explore some of that in rebirth and they also kind of started tying it to advent children a little bit at least in my opinion Um, no i'll agree with that so i can definitely see them doing a lot more with it in in the third part that's actually something really cool that i you know in the exact same way that aaron you said about like seeing more crisis core appear and also like seeing some advent children and like having Vincent like specifically reference Lucretia and all of his stuff and then having like his beast card in a uh, in Queen's blood and stuff um, it's very cool to see you know to, to take the game that started this massive mythology and then now that they're remaking it they're like re-inputting some of that mythology to also like make it a bit more congruent um, across the across the story. So we think that do we think that where Zach is, where Cloud and Aerith were, is an afterlife, a different timeline, parallel world. Okay, so like I can afterlife is what I'll say. I believe it's actually it's kind of vague, but so the way that they sort of uh, go into this is they have Sephiroth say, I want to, you know, remerge all the timelines and back into one. So I believe they're in a different timeline where different sets of events happen. And you can kind of see that with like the stamp. Like, yeah, the different stamp and some of the things that happened with the characters uh, not being alive and whatnot. So mm-hmm. in my opinion, it is definitely a different timeline. Mm-hmm. Well, there was exactly. also the the bit with Aerith and Cloud, where you're like you're in what is it sec- sector five, and everybody's just mentioning like one last something. Yeah, yeah, that part too kind of leaned more towards the like the afterlife angle because they made it sound like you know they were going to a funeral. <laughs> yeah, and so I was like the whole time I was like, oh no, like they're really building up this whole thing where you know something's going to happen to her and like you if you play the original you obviously know what's going to happen. Uh, yeah. But that they kind of leaned on it more in Rebirth, I thought it was an interesting angle. Yeah, because I guess at first Cloud saves her, and then it like does a does a Sephiroth flicker, and she's dead. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, and and then so close. Uh, you know later you see the characters like mourning her, and but then only Cloud can see her. So it's like, okay, <laughs> what what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. The Cloud seeing her afterwards was pretty like it was pretty deep. Well, he also he also looked up into the sky and he saw that the sky was all like fucked up and cracking in the same way that Aerith could see it when she like yeah. warned him. Hey, like, Don't let's look go up. on a fun date. Don't look up. Um, but to everyone else, it looks like a normal sky. So it kind of, it kind of has that idea of, you know, he's uh, like he's seen the truth of the world, and now he can, you know, he's seen the Matrix. Really, is what it is. <laughs> yeah, it he, can, is. he can see the Matrix in the machine. <laughs> it's gonna be dodging Shinra bullets in part three. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, oh, please totally. let's do that. I could see them going that kind of route where, like, because, like, Sephiroth and Aerith have already, you know, they've gotten to that point to where they can see the different timelines, and now that Cloud can too, like, is that going to be a thing, or are they just going to do something totally unexpected? Who knows? We're going to start doing some uh, Halo remastered, where you press a button and switch between OG graphics and new graphics. That would be the way they explain it. 
I could see that being a pretty interesting mechanic, especially if you were like having to climb through different like rubble in in you know the fallen sector, and then you hit a button and Cloud's now in a timeline where it never fell and like he can progress a bit more and then flip back to the dystopic world. So it's like the Starfield mission towards the end where you get around different obstacles by basically time hopping. Yeah. Yeah. So it's definitely a, an interesting place that it leaves us in. Uh, I think one of the things that we have all been grateful for as we have continued to play, continued to scope around for new cards and stuff, is how many incredible quality of, of life <clears throat> improvements they have made to the post game. Um, Auto picking up items. Why was this? Why wasn't this always enabled? Come on, guys. <laughs> oh, please. Yeah, I think the because I've been going through to 100% remake as I do. Um, and, you know, we were talking, I think, before the pod, but like the ability to go back to old chapters, but still keep your progress through like the main world. Thank you, um, because the fact that it took me 90 hours to beat the game and maybe do, I want to say 80 to 85 percent of like the world stuff, not including the multiple dates and some of the other stuff that you can kind of go back and redo, which I'm very much looking forward to seeing all of the dates. I know you guys have been doing that, but like trying to figure them out, <laughs> trying to figure them out. Yeah, it's it. it I think it'll be interesting to kind of be able to replay and really just focus on story and kind of remainline the story and see um, see some of the, the things a, a second time after playing the whole thing, but without having to recomplete every single quest, I think mm -hmm. is that's huge for me. Yeah, because I think even if you were just to like rush the story, you're still at like 40 hours, which is a lot of time. Yep, definitely. I think they recognize that uh, remake was a lot more linear in terms of like you could skip the quests and it, it they weren't huge at the end of the day um, unless you were going for like the Angel of the Slums achievement which you have to do every single quest. Um, but I think they recognize that like yo we built a really big world, let's let them keep their progress but maybe replay parts they wanted to see again, and I think that's a huge quality of life improvement. Yeah, for I mean, for as much as I've been going back and yet to look at like to relook at all of the dates and stuff, um, to be able to skip uh, the even to skip the gameplay segments of the Loveless play um, on a replay was amazing. You know, it, it meant that going back and taking a look at each date took fifteen minutes. So that's a really enjoyable thing to do. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I feel and like I, they, they kind of had to to make it more accessible that way, though, because like in, in Remake, the, there really wasn't a ton of side quests. You had like, uh, you know, some would open up and it was very linear, like you said earlier. Um, and then you would do them and that was it. And there really wasn't exploration or anything. So the fact that they in Rebirth said, OK, you know, we're going to make this really easy for you to go back and and see what you miss, I think, is or was a really good thing. Yeah, I think they understand that like the middle bit is so chunky. Even in like OG Final Fantasy, everything leading up to the Temple of, Temple of the Ancients, like that was a lot of time and there was a lot you could do. Um but like I I think it's one of the hardest parts for me to go back and and replay the original too is there's just there's so much um and there's no kind of replay if I just want to go back to a specific part. So then saying like, yeah, we understand that you guys love this game. Here's an easy way to get back to some of the parts that you might want to see again. They did. They did do that thing where it's like, OK, we're right before the, the point of no return. Here's a few new Queen's Blood players. Um, we've added hard modes and additional challenges to every single mini game in uh, in the Gold Saucer and around the map. Um, there's new, more difficult challenges in Cosmo Canyon. Uh, there's hard modes for all of the mini games, and here's 
five more side quests. Um, <laughs> just when you thought you were at the end, no motherfucker, here's 20 more hours of content. Yep, that was what got me. Because um, I was like, yeah, I'm, I just got into chapter 12, and Stretch is like, yeah, you have like four or five more hours. No, nah, motherfucker, that was like another 20 hours for me. <laughs> it got, I guess yeah. It I guess it depends. You could say that I'm on chapter 13 and I'm entering the temple and you have two to three more hours. Or if you're saying I have just reached chapter chapter 13 yeah. and everything has unlocked. Yeah, that's like 10 plus hours. <laughs> yeah, it, it just the way that it, it kind of opened up a lot more was mm -hmm. was nice, I think. Um, and like you were saying, Queen's Blood, too, makes you revisit places to hit every single person. So um, there's just, there's so much. There's so much. I I spent probably two hours today just zigzagging the open sea, um, specifically to find the pirate Jetsam. Um, but I still don't know what it does. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what it's for. Uh, um, I've, I've collected 23 of them. And I've swept the entire map. I don't know if they respawn. If it's just like a material that will always be out there. Is it in the play log as a number? I don't nope. know if I looked. Uh, it's, it's specifically in the material list. As if it's a, as if it's a crafting resource. Um, I wonder if it's tied to that transmute chip in the Golden Saucer. Because that I, didn't unlock until chapter 13. Okay, well, I guess I'm going straight to the Golden Saucer after this. Yeah, I could see it being that, because I didn't see anything that you could use it for either, actually, now that I think about it. I mean, I mean, this is, this is what I think is so great about the game. Not only are we talking about all of the things that we have seen, that we have done in common, but there's also, like, this thing tucked away over here, and that thing, and all of Johnny's, um, all of <laughs> Johnny's treasure trove. That was an incredible thing to open more than halfway through the game. It's just like, oh, there's there's 88 secret collectibles that we don't actually tell you are collectibles. And the only way to look at this list of collectibles is to come to here. And if you get all of them, there's a chest. And it's like, what the hell does that open? And I know that one of you know, one of the collectible items is for completing this nightmare difficulty survival challenge in Queen's Blood. Uh, and I'm honestly... And others sure are just that... buried, and you have to yeah. get them with your chocobo. <laughs> yeah, actually, I need to I need to circle back with you to see if you remember where you got the the one that you found digging. Yeah, <laughs> I, think I, I think I remember. So I'll, I'll have to pull up the map and I can send you a screenshot. Cool. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. I grabbed your guides team at it again. Oh boy. Trying to help each other. Uh, this, um, I mean, Aaron and I, you and I were chatting about the relationships and the difference between a standard date and an intimate date. Uh, and we have no clue what the defining trait of that is. Yeah, honestly, and I was asking a couple of people I know who have the game as well earlier, and they're like, uh, yeah, we, I, you know, they really don't know. So it, it's just like this giant mystery at the moment. Um, and the only thing that you really can do is just try to get the, the relationship percentage up and, and maybe mm -hmm. that matters. Yeah, just like each character has their own propensity. Like maybe it's just easier for Aerith and Tifa to fall in love with Cloud than Barrett. <laughs> right. It, I mean, it makes sense. And if you kind of like don't go after either of them, maybe it's easier to get the the other date where you get Sid, Vincent, and uh, Case. Yeah, I got Barrett. Um, I know that the goal was for me to get that one, but it was completely unintentional. I was just oh my gosh, out. that's really funny. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was just playing and talking to people and and, making and those then choices. all of a sudden Barrett's there. <laughs> yeah. And he knocks on your door. And you're like, all right, let's do this shit. I mean, that's also like for Seven to be so infamous for like, oh man, if you want to get that Barrett date, you need to make sure to like respond this and this in chapter two and then this here and that here and make sure to pick him here. And 
it's all kinds of convoluted. Um, well, they have a little bit of that too with the relationships in general. If you go after you beat the game, you have kind of the the play log. Mm-hmm. And if you go to each character, they have like specific events within the story that you had to have responded a certain way. Yeah. Uh, well, but the fact that they even outline that, and then you can go back to those chapters, and then you can also like replay the specific chapter, and in the additional settings, you can be like, okay, I want to be on the date with this character. Yep. And it like will lock out all others. Um, yep. That that is very nice listening from people's uh, not complaints, but at least uh, quandaries with the original. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, I think one of the other things I liked, too, was uh, in Remake, you know, you had the three in... uh, I'm blanking on the area. Uh, Um, uh, Don Corneo's area. Market. uh, Wall Market. Wall Market. Um, It was interesting seeing them again, just kind of out in the world. Um... Like, you know, you saw them at Junon, you see them, you know, on the ship and then later on in a couple other places. I thought that was kind of cool for them to be like, yeah, we're going to bring these characters back. And then obviously the whole like Chocobo Billy thing and his deep hatred for Sam. (laughs) Yeah, I I do like how those characters weren't really a a one off. Same with actually, uh, we haven't talked about him yet, but Roche coming back. I thought. Oh, yeah he was going to be really annoying, but they kind of, like, they took his story in a direction that I didn't really expect. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked that they kept bringing him back um, because he is over the top and it's hilarious. He he is, and I, I did like that he, he, like, respected Cloud, and that's usually something you don't really see from, I guess, enemy characters too much. Yeah. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Um, there's something to to say about both him and Zach. They're both like, you know, anime boy protagonists that kind of know that they're anime <laughs> boy protagonists. Like this, if he if he spiked the lens and winked at the player, like I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Break the fourth wall real quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think that that was like, they've done a really good job of like continually taking characters from remake and kind of like resurfacing them like even the, the sh- we were talking about this the shinra middle middle manager oh yeah i, d- I didn't expect that at all <laughs> yeah i saw it was like two weeks three weeks ago or something someone on reset era made a thread and it's like oh we're we gonna see the best character from remake return <laughs> and they were talking about the shinra middle manager and i'm sitting there you know having already got to the point where he's like the party animal of the golden saucer. It's just like, you have no clue <laughs> how much she is in this game. Yeah, it, you could you could tell somebody really had fun like writing that guy's stuff and putting him in the game. Well and like even like Kate Sith, I, if we talk about that for a second, phenomenal character. Mm-hmm. Just an absolute joy and the fact that and and this is my favorite part when you play as him when you sprint you just roll no yeah notes. honestly his gameplay really surprised me because he's kind of overpowered uh, even when you first get him and uh, in the original final fantasy 7 i never really liked to play as him so i just oh, yeah. kind of like push him aside and, and never Useless. play him <laughs> But in Rebirth, they they made him really good, and he's really good at like getting the stagger bar up. And uh, I thought it was neat how he fights like without the the Moogle Mog at first, and then you can bring him out. And he has kind of a different fighting style when you're fighting together with it. Yeah, I thought that that was a really good kind of expansion of a character that like I don't want to say people didn't care for, but like just wasn't as popular as anyone else. But they you know, with the, I'm assuming Scottish accent and, um, and kind of all just the flair that he has is just such a a very enjoyable character. Um, every time he's on the screen, Mm -hmm. even when he's stabbing us in the back, (laughs) even when he's stabbing you in the back, I'm like, you know what? I still love that guy. (laughs) I still love that guy. (laughs) Yeah, I, I was surprised that they did make him so likable because, like I said in the original, I was like, I hate that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, they, also, I think they knew what they were doing, but he's like just 
I I keep going back to it, but every bit of expansion they did on on characters was just phenomenal. Um, All of the stuff with Red and the Homecoming and the teases of the of the voice switches early, and you're like, who the hell is Aerith talking to in this locked room? And then he'd come out and speak to you as a gruff older older man. Yep. It's like, yep. no, he's 16, oh, 16 in human years. Yeah, uh, the red thing made me laugh so hard. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, that that cracked me up. Um, it, the uh, the Cosmo Canyon, uh, kind of the end of it, mm-hmm. gets me every time, mm-hmm. man. And it, yeah, it was and like even more impactful this time. It was, and then in the original, it always kind of got me really good. And this time, I was like, oh my god, it's even like more emotional. Yeah, yeah. I think that was like the thing for me is everything that I knew I was going to be emotional about. I was very emotional about. Um, yeah, even like even the stuff with Bear and dying, I was like, wow, they like really make you care about what's going on here. Yeah, the dying expansion, very good. Like, I I just I have really no notes on the story other than shorten. Temple of the Ancients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like. I kind of had a feeling going into the temple that they were going to expand it because I was thinking, like, you know, the original, you kind of had to wander around a little bit, and now that they're in 3D, uh, they added, like, all these puzzles and things like that, and mm-hmm. so I was like, all right, it's just going to take a while, and it did. Yeah. Uh, it was just so strange that, that you spend the entire game walking past small blinking lights, mashing triangle to pick them up quickly. And they're like, nope, you're going to have to pause, stop entirely moving, hold down triangle for three seconds. It's probably not even three seconds. It's probably just my brain exaggerating. It's probably like... No, it's about three seconds. (laughs) Yeah, it was a decent amount of time. And I think the other part of that that kind of like made it a little tedious for me was uh, the party getting split up and then having to do both sides of that story. Yeah, when I was writing notes about where to find some of the weapons, I was like, after the first time this party splits, after the second time the party splits, after the third time. And I was like, man, this I get what they're doing, but let's just blow through this. Yeah, I'm, I'm like try, I really I'm trying to get to the iconic end here. <laughs> I didn't really need to see Aerith picking up pieces of the live stream or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I did I did because that I mean they definitely split the party up a number of times. I think the weirdest, like, there were times that it made sense, like, you know, Barrett getting, like, caught in a, you know, caught as, like, the tunnel was breaking down or whatever. But the funniest time was, you know, Aerith sudden is like, oh, my feet hurt. It's like, okay, split the party. You guys go ahead. We'll catch up. And then we just immediately started walking. It's like, oh, we didn't even give her a break. What are we doing? <laughs> yeah, I thought that was kind of weird, but I was like, uh, okay, fine. <laughs> I mean, as tedious as it was, though, like, it was it was a pretty cool area like seeing her kind of grip her setra origins and and try and understand them i thought was was really cool um whereas in the original and again this could just be me not remembering i i feel like that wasn't quite as impactful it was kind of just like i'm an ancient and that's it um but in this one you kind of see her struggle with you know, I've never prayed before um, mm-hmm. and asking for essentially the planet to help her pray. I thought that was that was really cool. And then Stretch pointed out the when she was doing the dancing. Like, no, that was a prayer. That, well, was that was that you, Aaron? Yeah, yeah. Like it, it's basically the, the same scene from Final Fantasy X, uh, which I thought was a really cool callback because they have officially admitted that yeah you know final fantasy 7 and final fantasy 10 are in the same world it, oh i uh, haven't heard that what oh it, uh yeah uh, katase uh confirmed it a while back actually and even in remake there's a little hint uh to the to that connection interesting do we know like it as in it's a different continent or it's um uh like just in a different time uh Um, from what i understand it's like years in the future or past depending on the game so like is this uh, the thing about shinra yeah yeah okay and that's the the tease and remake 
Uh, and that kind of, you know, if you if you see it, you're like, okay, that's obviously reference from Final Fantasy X and X-2. Mm -hmm. And then now they've gotten more blatant with it in, in Rebirth with that Aerith scene, I feel like. That's cool. I love I that. It. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a really cool nod. Like when I first saw it, I was like, "Oh, yep, that's it." <laughs> I mean, hey, with the with the way that the weapons are designed, that we should definitely like circle back and talk about the weapons showing up so much earlier in this game. Um, but the way that the weapons are designed, I could totally imagine them becoming sin. You know, I actually had that same thought the first time I saw them, and then like the way that they swam through the live stream, I was like, you know what, this feels exactly like Final Fantasy X. Yeah. But yeah, so in the original game, the weapons only show up after Meteor is cast. Yep. And in this one, they are up and active and ready to go so early. Um, that was probably one of the craziest things for me, um, just to be... I mean, they looked gorgeous. They looked terrifying. They looked very different from their original design. Yep. Um, They're not giant guys... mecha warriors underneath the sea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it was surprising. Uh... And they, I think they kind of teased that early too because they, they're they probably going to expand on them in the third game. So hopefully we'll see that as well. I have to fight Ruby and I don't even remember all the all the versions. Uh, there was a lot of them, like Ruby, like Emerald, six in total or something. Topaz. Diamond. Diamond, yep. Yeah, it uh I did not expect that either for it to be kind of like you know, you walk into it was the Corel reactor that you saw them first, sort of, where uh, like, there's something going on down there. Yeah, yeah, they're they're like T's there and then you mm -hmm. see them later at Gangaga. Yep. Who? Me? Gangaga. <laughs> uh I mean, yeah, I, even, I thought that was really cool. While the whispers weren't touched on very much, it seems like there are now some whispers that are totally under Sephiroth's control, which are now the black hooded whispers. And then the rest are very, I mean, very obviously the white antibodies of the live stream trying to, <laughs> trying to cut him out. Um, Sephiroth's a sickness. Yeah, that and I kind of had like uh, Kingdom Hearts vibes with the like the black and white theme going on. Yeah, yeah. That's I. I'm such a Kingdom Hearts stan. There's gonna be there will be a lot of people who will see some of the shenanigans with the different timelines and trying to piece them together and the lights versus darknesses and everything and they're gonna roll their eyes and i'm just here like give me more of this <laughs> yeah I mean, people, <laughs> people were already complaining about that at the end of remake and i was just like okay i thought it was fine i mean i liked it so if you didn't that's you know cool <laughs> As, if, you, if you didn't like remake for those story changes this is I, boy have i got a trick for you to save 80 hours of your near future <laughs> <laughs> right exactly and like i said earlier i feel like changing it up is actually a good thing because we already know the story of Final Fantasy VII mm -hmm. and having unexpected things kind of keeps this new version interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it well like I think they they understand everybody knows the story very well. Many of us have I was telling a coworker about it. It's like I'm I've played 80 hours in this game in the last couple of weeks and they're like, "Oh, you must really like that game." I was like, "It's a remake." of one of the first games I played as a kid and it's like 20 however many fucking years later um I'm so excited for this game but I think they also recognize that like there's also been kind of changes to the world and so the story's kind of evolved a bit to meet that and I, I know one of the producers I said I think said something along those lines of like there's parts that we changed because x y or z um but I think they really kind of had this opportunity to say, all right, we told this story this way then. Mm -hmm. Here's what we'll do to tell it now. Um, and really just executed and executed very, very well on that idea. 
Yeah, and they, they've even talked about before, they're like, well, you know, we didn't do uh, just a remake of the same exact story because the original is still there that you can play, and it's pretty easy to get uh, on pretty much any platform nowadays, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can respect With that. With mods. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it, it's not like the original game is, like, buried somewhere you can't get to. I saw somebody... Um... Uh, Jess, who's a PR person, she was tweeting about how she put remake was her first Final Fantasy seven. And oh, so before wow. Rebirth, she's been playing the original. And I was like, you see, like, that's crazy to me. Not like in a bad way, but like I played the original back then and how impactful remake was for me. I wonder how it feels to do it the opposite way. Um. To go yeah. from a remake story and then go back to the original. Um, which is kind of cool for for a game to come out as a remake and then want get people to want to play the original. Yeah, especially with, with them releasing the remake project in parts. Like you you know there's gonna be people who are like, Well, I want to see the rest of the story, even if it's not going to be the same exact thing. Uh they can just play the original for now at least. I mean, if anything, that's probably, you know, for anyone who might not have played the original, but has come into Remake, now that Remake is a little bit different and they're expecting Rebirth to be different, that probably kind of opens up more people to be saying, well, I'm not just going to wait for the new different game. I can, you know, I can spend $7 on the, the PS1 game for my Switch and I'll play it there um, to get the experience of the original to then get something new. Yeah, it's great to see people going back and revisiting the original, like the the honest, like the staying power that Final Fantasy as a series has is just it's unmatched. Maybe Pokemon, but like. It oh, just I, think I, I don't even know. Definitely the top <laughs> as a yeah. huge Pokemon fan. I think Final Fantasy is definitely. <laughs> I think it's I will say it's probably not as widely. Like Pokemon appeals to so many different yeah. generations. I think Final Fantasy is a little, I don't want to say niche. It, it's not. But in, compar <laughs> in comparison, kind of JRPGs and RPGs in general are not as maybe widely adopted as, you know, Pokemon, which has Pokemon Go and, and trading card game and all that kind of stuff, too. Right, it definitely isn't a Final Fantasy mobile game. <laughs> no. First um, Soldier? No, that doesn't exist. Yeah. The the first soldier showing up in in uh, in Rebirth was a bit wild, hey? Oh, yeah. You know, when I first saw that, I was like, well, I guess they didn't want to waste, like, all that stuff they put in the first soldier because apparently it's a lot. And I didn't, like, I only played uh, a little bit of it because I'm not really a Battle Royale person. So I kind of thought it was this sort of, you know, throwaway game that's probably going to get turned off, and it did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that they have characters that matter for the for the remake project makes me want to like go back and see if I can find a video with all the story in it or something. Well, they after after the first soldier stopped this this new one that they brought out um, that has like the the like three person battle. Um, that one has a storyline for Crisis Core, a storyline for the original Final Fantasy VII, but it also has a storyline that goes over the storyline of the first soldier. Oh, Ever you're Crisis, talking about right? yeah, Ever Crisis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah. that downloaded, and I tried uh, the beginning of it, and then I was like, okay, this is another mobile game. How long is it going to be around? I don't know if I want to get invested in it. So I just right. yeah, the the fact that they've brought that they've specifically brought those characters back again kind of makes me feel like they were teeing up for something much larger with for a soldier and they're like well fuck we still have all of this important story oh yeah you know uh, I, I can absolutely believe that because of how uh i don't know if they did this with you guys but they really like uh on my website they really tried to push first soldier on this on us they were like hey we really want you to preview first soldier will you preview the the close beta we want you to preview the the new season mm -hmm. and you know they'd send us all these press releases for it and i was like uh okay <laughs> you know <laughs> i actually did 
we didn't get anything from Square about First Soldier that I remember, but I went and picked it up myself because I'm a Battle Royale junkie. Um, and I actually didn't hate it. So I, I thought it was kind of a, it was a unique twist on kind of Battle Royale with Final Fantasy elements. But I did, I'll be honest, I played 20 something matches. I didn't even realize there was a story. Um, <laughs> well, because because the the guy that we see, he and a younger, like a teenage Sephiroth, um, were out not <clears throat> not on the same missions together, but at least like crossed paths. Um, and there's also been a whole bunch of speculation as as to whether this guy is Cloud's dad. Hmm. Really, I hadn't seen that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've I've been I've been seeing bits and pieces of conversation that. All of this conversation has been bubbling, even though he has been the only thing that I have not seen show up in any promotional material. And judging by the way that Rebirth ended, he's going to be a pretty major part. Like he and Wu Tai are going to be a major part of, you know, refinalization, whatever they call the next one. Um, refinalization. I don't know. <laughs> Remake, rebirth, redeath, repeat. Repeat would be a great one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do think he will. Even uh, that scene, even though that scene with uh, with Rufus like sussing him out, and he's like, "Yeah, I know who you are." And then he shoots him. I was like, "All right, <laughs> well, that just happened." But he's he'll probably come back. I'm sure. There was also the stuff. What was the what was the the name? The shadowy head of Wu Tai. It was like Sarah for something. something General. General, yeah. it's, it's Sarah for something. General yeah. something. Because people also picked out that that's an anagram of Rufus. Yeah, and that's another thing I'm not surprised about because he kind of seems, at least in Rebirth, a little more like versed in what's been going on. Bro compared wants to the original. A war. <laughs> yeah, he does. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what else that they do with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's got big fuckboy energy. <laughs> it's like standing up in his pristine white car and just firing, <laughs> firing the Mako cannon. Like, sir, this will this will uh, piss off Wu Tai. He's like, I don't care. I was also looking looking at the map that that points over towards like Corel. So I'm not. Yeah. I guess I don't know really geographically where Wu Tai is in relation to everything else if i remember right it's like even further to the west, the west. Okay. okay yeah so i mean it wouldn't have, i don't think the cannon would have reached personally but you know <laughs> also that bullet's gotta go somewhere yeah. well, where did it go <laughs> god imagine if you were just like able to like as you're patrolling like the the center of the map in the boat just like big ass shell <laughs> sticking out. <laughs> well, that didn't make it very far. Yeah. So now that we've seen, we've had remake, we've had Crisis Core reimagine, we've had rebirth. Advent Children has just been in cinema. Do we think that they are going to risk remaking Dirge of Cerberus next? Uh, honestly, I hope not. <laughs> 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 I think actually I was going to say I hope so, but better. Uh, I think they already actually confirmed that it's going to be an Ever Crisis in some form, so maybe that counts okay. as a remake, maybe ish. Okay, I guess I can live with that. Um, and then kind of to 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 wrap us up, you know, what do you guys think is going to happen in the next edition, or what are you most looking forward to seeing? Um, oh my goodness. So the the one thing that I that I was kind of bummed about that didn't make it into Rebirth is Rocket Town. I really really wanted to go there, and they do have Sid show up in Rebirth earlier than he's supposed to, which kind of makes up for it. But he doesn't he doesn't get to join you as a guest party member or, mm -hmm. or a normal party member. So I'm looking forward to that as well as terms of like how he's going to play and and how that'll work out. But definitely Rocket Town, and then you know the whole story with Sid and. Uh, him him wanting to go into space and all that that's that's actually one of my favorite stories in the original so yeah. i, I kind of like i'm interested to see how they will expand on that for uh the next part yeah 
uh, chocobo breeding. Do you reckon they'll just so that I can go get Knights of the Round again? <laughs> I I wonder with the way that they have entirely overhauled chocobos and chocobo racing. Do you reckon that chocobo breeding will be in it? I hope so, because dude, getting an S rank chocobo was like it was science. <laughs> like I remember having I had a binder full of Final Fantasy VII walkthroughs. Um, and half of it was just about chocobo breeding and like the best places to to get the right ones, which ones you had to to breed to get like an S or an A rank and then a, so on and so forth. Like dude, it was I loved that part because it was just it was min maxing. Um, so Rut's looking forward to chocobo eugenics. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Um, I spent so much time on that, and the fact that there was kind of that reward at the end that was nice of the round was just kind of a really cool thing. Um, I guess speaking of chocobos, it was cool to see the different types of chocobos too, where you had similar to the original game, you had kind of standard chocobo, you had chocobos that could run up mountains, chocobos that could tr traverse water. Um, so the Ooh. next one has to have one that can literally do everything. The Nebel. Um, water chocobos were so much fun. So much fun. Uh, after after how after how disappointing the Gungaga ones were, it felt so great to just hit the water and take off. <laughs> well, you're saying you don't enjoy just eating off mushrooms? I think I think Gungaga is the weakest region for me, um, just for how how compact it was. Um, I will agree. Yeah, I, I agree think. with that as well. Like I've been watching Jared do that region and he's getting so frustrated. <laughs> it's just it doesn't it didn't like the the town is really cool, really neat mm -hmm. to see and kind of Cisne and kind of her if you do all the proto relic stuff, kind of seeing a little bit more about her. Again, that goes back into the doing the side quest gets you more tidbits. Mm -hmm. Um as well as some later quests that come up towards the end but like the town was really cool it was neat to see Aerith interact with Zach's parents and kind of see the impact of that but the rest of it forgettable yeah. um, still fun but like just not as when you have the golden saucer you've got Nibelheim and all these other things it just it it didn't feel like it had as much substance as the rest of the areas yeah, I can agree with that. And the fact that a lot of it was vertical traversing kind of hurt it because it was easy to just get lost and then you'd have to like walk around trying to get up uh, to where you needed to go. Yep, And you can't Skyrim in this game. <laughs> no, you cannot. Not a thing, unfortunately. Yeah, trying to get like trying to find those like lost few places for for different collectibles and data data points and world intel and stuff. Was such a pain. <laughs> well, like the temple area, I got stuck in trying to figure out how to get to like one part, um, and I was like, "This is really annoying." The temple was really cool, though. That kind of yeah, came out the of nowhere. Temple was like, cool, like getting oh, out of it. This was... is awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, the fact I think that there was just a, a remna wave just chilling inside of it. Yeah. Uh, I think the thing that I'm most looking forward to the next one is because. All of the set design and the set dressing and like the big set piece moments have been so incredible. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing Sephiroth encased in crystal and just how insane and over the top that is going to be. Think about the final boss fight. Mm -hmm. Like full angel mode. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they actually, I was surprised that they sort of like showed some of that already and like had him appear as more than just like you know his usual self i was like huh this uh they're kind of getting ahead of themselves there <laughs> but it, it was still cool to see i thought the last uh the final boss fight was more enjoyable than remakes i think remakes final boss fight had the same issue that the temple of agents had in that like you feel like you're so it's like when you're at the end of like a 10 hour drive 
and you've got like that last hour and you just want to get home <laughs> that the temple of agents ancients kept like throwing up more and more roadblocks traffic delays in the same way that like all of those little whisper of fate fights which is like i get it like i get that you're building but we've already been building during like the chaos and like the and the car chase and this and that like i want to do this fight i'm impatient i want i just want to get to this fight yep yep so but it was it. at least it was at least a really good fight i feel like most of the final boss fight in remake was you just fighting whisper rubrum stupid red idiot um, <laughs> yeah they kind of in the Sephiroth part it was really short in comparison mm-hmm. and it, it, this one was meaty like it was nothing but Sephiroth and yeah and even that surprised me yeah uh, he kind of had the, the different forms going on and then, then the very last part uh, I did not expect at all the uh, I think the thing that stuck out to me the most was Zach and him putting the buster sword to his forehead to essentially charge up. I was like, that's fucking dope. Like that's a great <laughs> idea. Yeah, and then, then like the uh, the synergy attack across timelines was really cool. Yeah. I think that's what it was for that fight was they just pull all these different elements in that really that was just really cool to see. Like let's pull all this random shit together. It, this is I, so fucking cool. It was a Kingdom Hearts boss. Like that was the Kingdom Hearts <laughs> final boss. Four different phases. One of the phases, he's a giant battleship for some reason. Another one, his arm, like it, that was just peak Kingdom Hearts uh, yep. in the best way possible. <laughs> All right. Well, I think unless anyone has any last words, that will wrap up our discussion. Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, um, you can, you know, we're releasing this at the time of Embargo Drop. You can check out the review and our plethora of guides. Let our combined 300 hours worth of knowledge about this game help you get through stuff a little bit faster. <laughs> um, but that has been us from TechRaptor. Um, you know, check out techraptor.net for the latest in gaming and tabletop news reviews and more um you know welcome back to 2024 and we'll see you guys next week yep we'll be talking uh helldivers so um get ready <laughs> <laughs>